Hello and welcome to The Debate. I'm your host, Sana Makbul, once again with you at BTV World, bringing you different stories from around the world and within Pakistan, and of course, detailed analysis and discussion on all of them. In today's show, we will be talking about three important stories, the first of which um, is, of course, the situation in India with regards to uh, Sikhs and, of course, the farm laws. Um, India's uh, continued actions and habit of blaming anyone that they disagree with, anybody who raises any voice which they don't like as extremists or terrorists. This, of course, has been exposed previously as well uh, from the EU Disinfo Lab and the Indian Chronicles. It has been exposed once again by a report of the CIR. And we know that this report has outlined the same kind of truths that have come uh, before uh, across all of us as well regarding this coordinated network in which the uh, Indian media is extensively involved, fake accounts are involved, fake media profiles are involved, all of which um, serve just one single purpose to influence different organizations and political leaders uh, um, for um, interests of Hindu nationalism um, and to of course uh, undermine voices which are against that um, as terrorists or extremists which of course uh, includes uh, the Sikh voices uh, for um, independence and of course uh, Pakistan as well which uh, has been targeted by India in the past as well. We'll explore this in further detail the extent that this campaign has been run. Uh, we've known this before as well and how much it impacts the legitimate rights of the Sikh community within India and outside of India as well. Um, then we will also be looking at a topic that we covered yesterday regarding of course the migration uh, politics uh, with regards to the situation in European nations. Uh, we have seen what the situation is like at the Poland-Belarus border. There are many people who are stuck there. They're facing a military standoff um, and, of course, the extreme weather conditions there as well. Um, and besides that, we also know that the channel crossings um, are all are bear witness to a lot of uh, migrants losing their lives by drowning. Um, and this is something which has been going on for a while now. Uh, the uh, uh, top uh, EU politicians uh, have been taking a look at this before. But what are the urgent measures that are needed? What sort of a cooperation is required for the European sides and what kind of uh, political interests play a hindrance in this is what we're going to be taking a look at in further detail and at the end we will also be taking a look at the uh, introduction and the consideration of the local government amendment bill that has been uh, bulldozed in the Sindh assembly which of course is a big question mark on democracy this coming after uh, many uh, of the bills that have been passed by the federal government were under a lot of scrutiny um, and the democratic pr pr processes uh, were questioned uh, uh, by the opposition parties of, of the government um, and this of course is really important right after uh, these uh, leaders who were chanting slogans of democracy and being the flag bearers of democracy go ahead and do something which is highly undemocratic. Um, we will start with the first topic which of course um, is the Sikhs that have been uh, targeted by fake news media outlets and accounts many of which have been exposed. For this we have a package that has been reported by our team. Let's take a look at that first before we include guests in the studio. A report was published by the Center for Information Resilience which exposes a large-scale operation to propagate Hindu nationalist agenda. A coordinated influence operation on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram is using fake personas acting as influencers within the Sikh community to discredit the push for Sikh independence, label Sikh political interests as extremists, stoke cultural tensions within India and international communities and promote content in support of the Indian government's position. The report identified a core network of 80 fake accounts that interacts with a much wider network of accounts which appear to be authentic to spread and amplify content generated by the core network. The content produced by the network has endorsements from verified accounts and has breakouts on news and informational sites. While the core fake network maintained its presence on all three platforms through repeated posting and sharing of content produced by the other fake accounts, it gained significant momentum through its activity on Twitter rather than Facebook or Instagram. This report is reminiscent of the EU Disinfo Lab report which unearthed a 15-year-old operation run by an Indian entity that used hundreds of fake media outlets and the identity of a dead professor to target Pakistan. And of course, you get uh, an idea of what has been going on with India and their coordinated and extensive efforts to malign Pakistan and um, any other voice that they uh, disagree with. And for, for further discussion on this, of course, we have Mr. Farah Khodafi and Raja Faisal with us in the studios. We will also be joined by our respected guest, Sukhminda Singh Hansra, who's a senior journalist. Uh, before we include you, Mr. Hansra, thank you for joining us um, in the discussion on the debate. Um, we also want to, of course, uh, consider that this is something, Farah, 
that we have seen in the past as well. Um, and and it's, it's sad that we, we can't control our laughter at this because uh, it's, it's, it's something serious, but then it's so ridiculous. Um, and it's been going on for a while now. We've right. seen such things being exposed to in the past. The extent to which these people right. want to go is... Uh, because you said laughter. Hmm. So I will want him to start because All right. I cannot control my tears. <laughs> oh my God. Three, to me, it's just another ticky pack of hmm. uh, EU decent for laugh. <laughs> Okay. Right, and it, it was is. it was to control whatever was going on in Punjab. Okay. Number one and number two, uh, they uh, obviously they had uh, uh, reservations on whatever was going on in the U in Europe. Khalistan movement was at its full swing, so they wanted to use these accounts. I mean, the funny, very funny accounts mm -hmm. like uh, you know Simran Kaur and these sort of and majority the majority the, uh, no offense, but majority majority of the names they were using they were actually female names. Okay. Just to lure the people in, yeah. and the people who were sitting in the sit-ins, they just wanted to drag them out from there. Does that and work? How funny is that it a is! You know, it was yet another. Yeah. It was yet another Shirivastava group, very active this time. Not against Pakistan, as we know that f for 15 consecutive years they've been, uh, you know, putting extra money. 15 by the hard right of India. Oh Otherwise, yes. India has been doing it for ages. For exactly. Right. right. For ages. And and uh, honestly, um, uh, regarding uh, laughter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, there's uh, this uh, couplet. Pehle aati thi halat dil pe hazi, ab kisi baat pe nahi aati. There was a time when I used to laugh mm. at the state of my heart, but I no longer do that. Uh, I tell you why. Um, a country like um, India, which has 1.3 billion people, mm -hmm. its mind seems to have gone all flat. Right. I don't understand what is going on. Look, disinfo lab is one thing. This operation, this influence yeah. operation is another. Then you look at the FinCEN report where so much money was actually sent from India to bad accounts, mm. right? Mm. Right. And after that, you actually go back to another thing because you were talking about the farm laws. Mm. Remember when the protests were going on uh, at the start of this year and the last one, uh, Greta Thunberg, Thunberg yeah. mm. actually tweeted something and um, her local partner, Disha, uh, her name is Disha, Disha Ravi, the poor thing actually just retweeted that tweet and then she was accused of uh, a young girl. Yeah. She was accused of uh, sharing the toolkit hmm. and then she was actually in turn taken to the court and jail. Hmm. Then that happens. Hmm. I mean, I really, really shrink. And I think something sad has gone on right. with the India. Right, the level, the extent yeah. to which they're involved. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, being afraid of a young activist mm. or actually uh, uh, getting afraid of your own people. Mm. Mm. And then remember, there's something that is very sad. And that is uh, all these dog vessels they use. Mm. For Muslims, This is there are two things. Mm. One, the Muslims are, um, uh, you know, terrorists. Mm. Or then they are meat eaters. Or then the third thing that they procreate a lot. Mm. And with Sikhs, every time they talk about any Sikh who wants to stand up for his rights, they end up calling him Khalistani. Or so, the extremist authorities. Yeah. Everyone's a terrorist. Then, then with Christians as well, mm. umpteen ways mm. to actually, there, there are people who literally went into various churches and said this property is India's and mm. vacated. Mm. Mm. They are also your people. Absolutely. Yeah. And, Absolutely. And, and, and the fact and we need to highlight fact yeah. that we need to highlight, yes, uh, I mean, people are talking about that uh, oh, there are revolutionary changes uh, uh, within India that are taking place in terms of revolution. Uh, uh, revolutionary changes coming into India in terms of, uh, uh, you know, factories becoming, uh, uh, factories coming to India. Uh, there is another uh, term called evolution. I have stopped believing in it <laughs> since I have seen India's politics. But it's true, I, I it's you. true. Let's also, let's also include our respected guest, yeah. Mr. Hasra, in the, in the conversation as well. Um, we can, of course, talk about this at length and uh, try to understand the fact that this, of course, is, is such a desperate and detailed move by India and these parties are engaged in, in such an activity based on their hatred and to and to of course advocate such of a, uh, such 
hatred against minorities and 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 the reminders of course uh, uh, that, that are being made the parallels drawn with Modi and Hitler um, um, are something that of course uh, c come into play when we hear such things because Hitler also went uh, uh, qu quite at length to uh, work uh, a scenario which is in favor of his own ideologies his own thoughts and to of course propagate hatred towards a particular community the same sort of extensive brain space and effort is being uh, taken up by authorities in India right now against uh, minorities which are already suffering at their hands. Sir, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, Mr. Hansra, so con con considering that we have seen such such things in the past as well and the, extents, the extent that uh, the Indian authorities have gone to in terms of uh, uh, propagating such news and uh, creating fake accounts, um, uh, does this not point out to a highly desperate need of the regime to prove its worth? Well, in 2019, when the Sri Vastava group's uh, fake uh, uh, 265 websites against Kashmir and, uh, and Pakistan was surfaced uh, by uh, Europe uh, uh, Disinfo Lab, uh, it, you know, it, it, it did some, some sort of worry for me uh, that uh, the Indians uh, are, are up to something. And then, you know, uh, Pegasus spyware they've been using on their own people, on their own politicians. Uh, uh, now they're baffling with it. With, with this new report, uh, CIA, uh, uh, the Center for Information Resilience, uh, it didn't baffle me. It didn't worry me. Okay. As a matter That's of fact, uh, uh, you know, minorities they clap you know uh, they they do all sorts of things to suppress right. the minorities but the minorities are keep coming back uh, just like we saw uh, in these farm protests after a year of sitting in new delhi uh, the the knees couldn't take weight of uh, modi anymore and 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 he collapsed. So, uh, uh, you know, using fake names, using uh, uh, young women actresses uh, to create uh, uh, profiles. Then, you know, bash Khalistani movement. Khalistani movement is is above the fray. It's not anymore on the social media uh, 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 platforms anymore. It's actually in the hearts of. Uh, of millions of Sikhs around the world. So they, they fail to understand that. They fail to comprehend the importance of the event. And I believe uh, this report is uh, putting them far behind in their own uh, endeavors. Right, Mr. Hansra, another uh, really important uh, impact of uh, such such a propaganda campaign um, is, of course, uh, that a line and a distinction is drawn uh, between different communities and different people. They're being categorized and put under labels of who's who's a real Sikh, who's a real Hindu, who's a real nationalist, um, and who are fake Sikhs, who are fake Indians, um, and who don't feel anything for the country. Um, th this this sort of distinctions between black and white. Um, have have an impact of of justifying the kind of uh, effort, uh, uh, the kind of measures that the community can take against a particular community. Even the even the common people uh, can uh, can deem some some action or violence against a particular community as legitimate and justified. Does the Indian regime not realize that this kind of spreading of hate actually causes uh, a lot of discord within the community itself? Uh, this is also a worrisome for all of us. Uh, we're taking these actions here in Canada because they have targeted uh, Canadians, uh, uh, six UK six and American six more more than anybody else, and uh, and uh, and they're calling upon those six who are actually nationalist. I don't know where mm -hmm. they find them. Uh, there is no Sikh who believes in a New Delhi administration anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually never believed them since 1948 when when they labeled six as a criminal tribe so you know they're the one who severed that relationship now they sort of you know uh, uh, they wish that uh, india 
uh, India Six uh, will become uh, nationalists. We are not nationalists. We are Six. We are Punjabis, and now we are Khalistanis after 1984. So uh, they need to understand that. And uh, the worry some is that they're calling upon some of those Six to take actions against uh, 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 Khalistanis uh, 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 around the world. So hmm. what that action could mean. It could mean some violence. It could mean some uh, uh, bashing among the local six, and we're trying to call upon the the, the safety minister of Canada uh, to to stop this interferences in in a Canadian soil because there are so many raw operatives here in uh, Canada, and they have been caught many times by the mm. government, by Indian, uh, by the six, and has been reported. So uh, uh, you know, I believe that uh, this is going to call a great deal of vigilance uh, uh, on on the part of the six. Uh, not right. only per perhaps, on Mr. Hansra, there there may not be uh, there may not be a Sikh, as you say, who doesn't understand that. But with with the community at large, uh, the people in India and the people in different parts of the world. they can be fooled by such propaganda and such large scale and intensive uh, propaganda there might be people who of course believe the kind of things if these actions and operations are influencing decision makers and politicians then of course people are also getting influenced by it is there some sort of counter measures uh, that uh, the sikh community um, or or on the members and supporters of the community uh, are uh, taking uh, with regards to this operation Will you uh, allow me to add to sure. this question uh, azhar ji uh, just one question when indian media is actually uh, uh, filling in for the role of troll army why do they need all these influence hmm. operations the entire media is in their control they can do it everywhere well the, the this so called godi media uh, had, that term has become uh, it's actually their achievement uh, it's still baffling with the with the reports that the modi collapsed before the kisan uh, Uh, movement, uh, so they still haven't recovered properly from it. That's why uh, they never even bothered to report on this uh, very important report by uh, Center for Information Resilience. They don't, you know, because they don't know what to say about it. So uh, sure. when when it comes to nationalist six, uh, there isn't any. There is a fringe element. You probably will find. Well, you didn't find anybody. Uh, in London uh, on 31st, when they were voting for Khalistan, uh, uh, that broke their heart. That mm -hmm. broke uh, New Delhi's heart. That how many Sikhs could actually line up to to stamp uh, on a Khalistan uh, uh, liberation uh, openly uh, while the cameras were on, while the 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 media. Faisal, considering the fact that with the, there are reports um, of uh, no evidence surfacing as to the Indian government's involvement in these operations, or uh, that a coordinated uh, single person or single authority is behind that, even though, of course, everybody understands what is going on between the lines, but if we don't have Uh, the sort of evidence that perhaps the international community is requiring at large to maybe uh, take a certain step um, is is there something that people around the world, uh, politicians and communities around the world, do to actually uh, undermine the efforts of such large-scale operations? Of course, we talk about fake news. We talk about responsible media and um, social media organizations playing their part. Does this also not come under that? Uh, Sana, when whenever we talk about Hitler, we do talk about uh, Joseph Goebbels. Because mm. Joseph Goebbels was someone who actually ran his media at that time, uh, but today's, I mean, the way uh, today's Indian media operates, I mean, throughout the world, everyone recognizes uh, today's majority of the Indian media as Joseph Goebbels for Modi. So I think, I think, uh, uh, I mean, it's an, uh, it's something that everyone knows, and we don't need to repeat again and again that today's Indian media is Joseph Goebbels playing the role of Joseph uh, Joseph Goebbels. I wanted to highlight one more thing, hmm. if you allow, yes. and that was that uh, uh, you know uh, the minority of uh, Sikh, Sikh minority in India has a very good importance, and that's why uh, when when the Indian uh, regime it saw the Modi regime it saw that uh, you know uh, Khalistan movement was at at its full swing, and of course uh, farmers pro protest was going on, and then uh, a referendum was going on as well in the West. Hmm. So what they came up. they came up with false flag attack as well 
if you uh, go back to uh, 10th or 11th of uh, October uh, the previous month, you would see an attack that took place in Jammu uh, on Sikh regiment and five of the Sikh uh, soldiers, they actually died in that attack and why it took place. To me, it seems like a perfect false flag attack because they wanted to hit referendum, because they wanted to hit the movement of uh, Khalistan, be because they wanted to hit the farmers movement, they wanted to control it, they controlled it through that way. Right. They, they reminded people of Punjab, they reminded Sikh people that this is what is going on and Pakistan is running these shows. Whereas I'm pretty much sure that if we deep dig into that attack, then it would turn out to be a false, a false flag attack. Absolutely. We also thank uh, Mr. Sukhminder Singh Hasra, who's the senior journalist, for joining us on the debate and uh, giving his precious comments in the show as well. And of course, speaking of journalists and the situation of democracy in India, we also know um, in a recent interview, um, the Indian journalist Rana Ayub also talked about how um, uh, the, there is a lot of abuse and, of course, discrimination uh, that uh, she's been facing. Um, and this, of course, uh, brings to light the, the kind of uh, democracy uh, that people are witnessing. In India, to which uh, our information minister has also responded and talked about how uh, the policies of vengeance uh, go as far as uh, um, uh, the journalists are concerned, the journalistic community, and this is what's going on in uh, Modi's India. And this then uh, combined uh, with the state of affairs, with the human rights violations, uh, people in occupied Jammu and Kashmir, um, uh, Muslim minorities within India, um, uh, different policies and laws that have been uh, put uh, in place after Modi's regime, even the situation of Christians um, and and, and then, of course, uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, laws and actions that are being passed uh, by this regime points to the fact that, of course, there is a disaster-like situation that is going on in India. But despite that, they are not facing the kind of consequence that they should be facing. Here, here I, yes. think, uh, I think if, uh, Farooq, you being the most, most senior among, amongst us, of course, we need to say something about Rana Ayub. I mean, the, yeah. way, the mm. way she is, uh, you know, stu standing up there against yeah. all of the cases, please. please right. uh, let me uh, f first uh, very quickly remind you, I understand that we have to cover three segments, so I mm. will be quick and you can stop me whenever you want. Mm. Uh, I will stop. But Rana Ayub's uh, whole story is yeah. so heartrending mm. and amazing. She's yes. a very brave person. Uh, she has been confronting Narendra Modi since 2002. And uh, as a result, she has been totally uh, marginalized. Hmm. Everyone keeps on attacking her. Uh, she is threatened. Uh, and this, there is this new way of uh, Hindutva, uh, you know, uh, extremists, uh, their technique, that they threaten women with rape. Hmm. And that has been uh, happening repeatedly. And she has been pointing it out as well. Uh, her courage uh, is really laudable and it the is. entire world actually praises that. Uh, but while you were talking about everything, so many pictures were coming to my mind. Nishan Sahab is hoisted and yeah. Indian media starts calling it Khalistani flag. You don't even know your own culture. True. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I mean, uh, he was talking, Faisal was talking about false flag, one-liner. One uh, I remember Clinton is about to visit uh, India and all of a sudden six are killed in Kashmir hmm. and then ja Mujahideen are uh, blamed. Every time this happens and this, is, this has become a sad joke hmm. that uh, such things happen and then India pretends that it is the victim and usually who gets uh, killed, uh, they are the people, Sikhs and Muslims hmm. are their very favorite scapegoats. That has been that, of course, Canada. is is the unfortunate state of affairs that we're experiencing. Let's talk about another very unfortunate state of affairs, which, of course, is the refugee uh, and the migrant crisis that we've been seeing um, in different uh, parts of the European nations. Uh, we discussed this at length yesterday as well was going on at the uh, Poland-Belarusian border. Uh, but uh, to uh, to further uh, deconstruct this this these politics and to understand uh, how they actually come into play, we thought we'd also discuss it today. And for this, we have been joined by Joseph Hayat, who is a senior analyst. Thank you for joining us on the debate.
I'll start with you. We discussed the situation um, regarding uh, the migrants um, in European nations yesterday. Um, and earlier uh, in the show today, we were discussing about how lines and distinctions are drawn uh, between different people. Uh, they are labeled as terrorists or extremists just to justify certain policies and certain actions by different governments. Uh, similarly, I feel um, that, that people uh, in, in European nations um, um, uh, are also perhaps labeled and uh, distinguished as something separate uh, than the people uh, of their countries. Um, the fear of the other, as they say, is, is extremely important over here because this is what comes into play when certain policies are justified. Uh, do you think that this is something uh, that has been done uh, with regards to extending certain policies in Europe? Well, Sandy, you're absolutely correct in your analysis. Indeed, it's something we've seen as a common trend across, across uh, elections in Europe and the rise of the populist agenda on this very narrative. Uh, it is very convenient for the governments of France and the United Kingdom uh, to have this at the top of the agenda as much as the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson now seeks to deviate the attention way because, frankly, lives are being lost over politics, uh, which is a shameful action. Uh, it has been a common friend, uh, trend all along for the last few years. It, it, this, certainly when we look at the UK side of it for a second, the seeds were sown back in the New Labour years, that's in the early 2000s, because despite having a left of centre government uh, governing the country, uh, it, it did not address to the average uh, Brit, the average member of the population's view and perspective, the issue of migration. And the issue of migration uh, and those of, uh, you know, want, uh, asylum seekers seeking refuge in the United Kingdom, is there is a media narrative out there that uh, poses them as, you know, in invaders is one of the terms we've, we've seen coined by political uh, leaders and party leaders at times, um, because it is seen as an economic threat uh, to the country, when in fact there is an aging population uh, and a need to have uh, migrants, whether that be uh, economic migrants or asylum seekers, uh, entering the country uh, for the sake of the economy. And we saw that, for example, uh, post-Brexit in the United Kingdom. There was a massive shortage of uh, uh, certain profes uh, professions, at least not uh, low-skilled workers, uh, for, frankly, roles that members of the public were not prepared to do. Uh, and, and this is why it is a, it is a weapon uh, that is being often used. But the reality is this is criminal gangs at the forefront of this that are profiting hundreds of thousands of euros every year uh, for putting lives at risk. Absolutely. Joseph, uh, yes, Farouk. If you allow me to ask one question. Joseph, um, I'm glad that you are talking about these uh, matters because you understand Europe and UK inside out. Let me ask you uh, to actually help us deconstruct this uh, uh, story about so many people who uh, sank uh, day before yesterday. And uh, uh, this, uh, this bit about uh, the channel and how UK and France are both blaming each other. Can you help us understand and deconstruct this story? Well, this is a long-standing issue that's gone on for many years. And I think if we may, I'd like to just go back in time to the time of the Calais jungle. That was the coined term for the uh, unofficial refugee camp that existed in Calais uh, that was serviced only by NGOs. It had a population in excess of 10,000. And we saw uh, both migrants and asylum seekers going to that location for some 25 years. I mean, I, I recall back in the mid-90s seeing them, uh, I'm sorry to say, pleading for support at fuel stations in northern France. It's, it's been an issue that politicians, frankly, haven't wanted to deal with uh, for a long time. Now, when the UK voted to leave the European Union, uh, it was seen as another political point-scoring exercise to, for the French uh, government to reduce its, its investment, its impact on the control of the issue. And, and, and you know, the consensus along many is that they allowed these individuals to try and uh, uh, illegally make entry into the United Kingdom. But frankly, to the French, uh, to the defense of the French, the, the, the British government have turned a blind eye. And now we are seeing an extreme response from the uh, Home Secretary, Pretty Patel. She's talking about boots on the ground in France, in, in peacetime Europe. Um, but this is because it has rhetoric that works well with the British voters at this time based on the uh, polls, the YouGov polls, we know that the governing Conservative Party are ahead because they are deemed to be addressing these issues. But fundamentally, the reason is the, the, it is, of course, international waters. It is a very short stretch of water uh, to cross. It's about 27 miles uh, across in distance at the uh, shortest point. Um, so it is perceived as being 
an easy route. But also there is a misconception sold by the smugglers that there is economic opportunity. I mean, an asylum seeker, uh, upon reaching, assuming they are not returned to France, because it depends on which area of the channel they are stopped at, if they, are, if they safely make it to UK shores, they are only entitled to £39.63 a week. Now, if I may, just to put that into perspective for the viewers, the minimum costs of living in the UK for food shopping, regular supermarket shopping, we're not talking in market store shopping, we're not talking restaurants here, or hotels and these kind of things, is in excess of £40. That's before you paid for any electricity, any phone, any, you know, the usual uh, things that one needs to survive. So right. the hardship and, and, is and there. Economic matters are understandable, and then these people are mostly escaping uh, you know, human rights conditions and instability as well. Yeah. But there are others. Uh, how the European countries uh, where Faisal actually operate is the biggest question, right? Yeah. I, I just wanted to uh, ask, uh, I think it's a good opportunity for us to have uh, uh, Joseph with us because he's someone who's, uh, you know, I'm getting enlightened by. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, you were talking about Calais, Jungu, and we know the facts that uh, before Brexit, of course, the rules were different at that time. And uh, everyone wanted to get into Britain because they were facilitated well in Britain at that time. But now if we talk about the uh, European Union and if we talk about Britain, of course, they don't have s such type of, uh, you know, uh, agreements between uh, uh, them they, to ensure the safety of the people and to ensure that, uh, you know, channel is, is being crossed. Uh, in, a, in a safer way. Of course, it can't be uh, in a safer way, uh, ca can't be crossed. But I just wanted to Small know, words. are there any bi bilateral, uh, you know, talks going on between Europe and uh, Britain on the issue? Because this is something that reaches to, uh, you know, humanism, humanitarian cause. And just to just to talk about it, I mean, b both of the uh, EU as well as Britain, both of them, they always highlight the uh, human rights, highlight the humanitarian causes. And don't you think that they, they should be if they are not? And I'm sure that they must be in the talks somewhere, uh, you know, somewhere around the corner trying to draw some lines about it. Well, indeed. And what's happening now is Prime Minister Boris Johnson is talking to his French uh, counterpart, Emmanuel Macron. And they've had numerous phone calls, but we're not getting official reports yet on what the actual outcomes are to resolve the matter. Uh, Britain has been uh, paying uh, tens of millions to the French, and the French are rebuting that, saying that they also have uh, you know, budgeted tens of millions with the gendarme. That's the special uh, type of uh, police designation that, that effectively control that area and, and try and keep stability uh, at the border. Uh, but this is, this is going to, I'm sorry to say, be a consistent game of ping pong. And it literally was lit up in flames shortly after Brexit because this unofficial refugee camp was cleared. It was cleared very forcefully. There were fires. There were, uh, you know, the whole place was torched. But their belongings were lost. And they effectively just, uh, just, you know, parted from the site into several different directions, some towards Dunkirk, others towards Paris, uh, and also in towards Belgium. So all that's effectively happened is these 10 to 15,000 individuals have just disbanded and are now seeking more vigorously to cross the channel. And we've seen it also in Eastern Europe. The Polish don't want the migrants coming from Belarus because it is a similar mindset across the board because it gives the impression to the wider public, to the electorate and all of these EU nation states that Project Europe is failing. And that is not conducive, obviously, to the mission of the European Union. So as long as the uh, ruling Conservative Party, which is, of course, a right of centre party in Britain, can be deemed to be uh, tough on borders, then it's hitting the electoral narrative that they are so desperate to assert. The difference in this case is, uh, I'm sorry to say, all lives matter, but 27 is an inconvenient number for government ministers to have to see on the front pages of British newspapers, because that evokes the human nature, as you say, and the compassion of the electorate, that that suddenly becomes an issue. But ordinarily, I'm sorry to say, the, the, the asylum seekers, the same individuals that are migrating, their blood, their lives, their deaths uh, don't seem to matter. Although I will give credit to one organization, and that is, of course, the, uh, indi the, the RLI, uh, the individual group that is a, is a non-profit organization that is deliberately going out there to help uh, you know, rescue these individuals. And, of course, commanders of all ships and vessels within the English Channel on hearing distress signals or seeing those individuals in distress 
are mandated and legally required to uh, rescue them. So hmm. as long as that legislation is there, which is an international norm, as we know, it is very hard to push the blame on one another in international waters. The reality is... Right. Uh, sorry, I'll just... Right, and Joseph, we, we've seen the fact that this, of course, uh, uh, is not something that has happened today. It has been happening uh, for a while now. It happened before as well. Um, and every time we've seen um, that leaders have come forward and talked about how action is required, uh, how a lot needs to be done. Um, uh, but uh, uh, then again, uh, such things keep on happening, and they have uh, happened uh, again and again. Um, we, we've seen that the, the calls um, um, require urgent actions uh, from the political leaders um, and the governments. What exactly are, there, are those actions that are required? What is the immediate step, do you think, that uh, perhaps Macron or Boris Johnson can take? Well, they've got to go after these smuggling uh, gangs, these mafias, because they are the ones that are allowing physically, literally, for this to happen. They're arming them with the hmm. dinghies and the tools and equipment that they need, or inadequate equipment, I should add, uh, to cross the English Channel. So that's got to be eradicated on a localized and regional level. But I think more in a geopolitical, international perspective, the biggest challenge, I think, for the British government and for NATO members and EU members uh, that have been involved in several conflicts in the Middle East and, of course, uh, across the world and, of course, in neighboring Afghanistan as well, is to accept responsibility for the, you know, the impact and the after effects and the longevity of previous international uh, policies and especially those that have involved conflicts or invasions that have evoked this crisis to be far worse. I referenced the early 90s earlier in this segment. That was the time, obviously, of the Kosovo War. And it was quite a regional, localized issue that evoked that. We, did, we had some Iraqis, obviously, still seeking uh, refuge. But just a year and a half or two years ago, I was on the Iranian border on the Turkish side, and it was inundated by Iranians and Iraqis and Afghans still seeking refuge, citing uh, economic uh, uncertainty hmm. or safety concerns, which have just been expedited by the mess of a withdrawal from Afghanistan, as we saw earlier in the year. Right, and Joseph, my last question to you would be, we've seen that uh, the uh, the President Alexander Lukashenko has uh, been blamed for spreading disinformation, for causing the migration crisis that we've seen at the border. Uh, but is it only him? Is it not um, um, other European nations who've been involved um, in perhaps the same kind of spread of disinformation? Or for that matter, uh, not enough spread of the correct information uh, for the asylum seekers that they will not find the kind of security that they're looking for? Well, we've seen various responses to this. There was the famous case in Hungary of an extreme far-right neo-Nazi mayor who put up pictures of, uh, of graphics of burqas and saying, you know, Muslims are not welcome. Uh, and, and they were known to be uh, hitting them. And then there was the case, of course, of the Hungarian, I believe, camera lady, a camera operator, female camera operator, who physically beat an individual uh, for the sake of drama on the screen. It's, it was that mm. horrific. Um, so there's not been a very nice narrative displayed by acts of aggression. Uh, the, those on the right of centre politically will point the finger at the likes of uh, former Chancellor Angela Merkel, of course, of uh, Germany for having an open door policy at a time of uh, real uncertainty during the Syrian uh, crisis that we've seen over the last decade. Uh, but fundamentally, I think NGOs need to step up too. I've not yet seen, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'd love to be corrected by the viewers if I'm wrong on this, but there is little to no information being put out by the NGO saying, actually, it's better you go and climb, uh, claim asylum in your own home country if you're in a safe position. Don't put yourself okay. at risk to cross the waters and don't put your lives at risk because hmm. nobody is going to be there to pick up the pieces. It's a political ping pong game. Right, absolutely. Thank you very much, Joseph, for joining us Thank on you. the debate and um, sharing your opinions with us. Uh, Farouk, you had a lot to say about this topic yesterday as well. Yeah. So why don't you conclude for us? Conclude for you. Yes. Uh, well, well, the entire burden is on me. Uh, <laughs> how, ma how many minutes do, you, uh, do I have? Three. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me just remind you where we left yesterday. We were talking about various things that keep on happening. Uh, if you remember, we were talking about uh, 2015 Greek, uh, uh, you know, refugee crisis because the Syrians came over there. And because of that, there was so much uh, pushback in, the Euro in Europe that eventually we saw the uh, rise of far right. And let me remind you what major things happened after that, uh, apart from rise in other countries hmm. of the far right, 
we saw Brexit, we saw then in the US, hmm. Donald Trump, hmm. who was especially uh, an immigration related or focused uh, candidate, he also came into power. Now once again, it seems that uh, the people who actually thought that these things can actually uh, have that kind of impact are trying to trigger something. And I tell you why I'm saying this. On one side, you look at uh, how uh, in, in Europe, the, the uh, centrist and leftist parties are being pushed to actually placate the right wing agenda, right? Uh, as long as Macron actually keeps on uh, conceding, he will lose because he is playing to their tune. Similarly, Boris Johnson actually came from right. Now he is in the center. And I think that he is also going to be eaten up by other people hmm. uh, in the far right. And uh, while this happens, let me remind you, our first topic was what? It was about influence campaigns. Hmm. Do you know how people actually ended up in Belarus? Hmm. Th uh, through Facebook posts yeah. and right. fake news. And I just keep on trying to connect all these things. I, and I feel that there is something strange going on. People blame Russia, people blame uh, Belarus. Mm. I think there are other, uh, uh, you know, animals in the, in the crowd that we have to look at, particularly those countries that want some kind of conflict between A. Uh, remember, even if the uh, boat sinks, it is good news for the far right because then it uh, keeps the issue of immigration uh, at the center stage. So these people must be those who want the, some kind of conflict between West and uh, the poor uh, Muslims of the world, right. or immigrants. And one final thing, then there's this uh, great replacement theory uh, that actually is used so much in propaganda that the uh, people from East are coming and they're going to replace the white race. Hence, <laughs> the rise of, uh, uh, you know, neo-Nazis mm -hmm. and white nationalists. That is very sad. It is, here. it is. And Faroha, you mentioned how these strange things are happening. And all of what we discussed today is quite strange. Another strange thing that has happened today uh, is, of course, the introduction and the uh, consideration of the local government amendment bill, which has been bulldozed in this in the Assembly. We have been joined by Barrister Hassan Mezza, who's a parliamentary leader in the Assembly. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on the debate, sir. Um, of course, your tweet um, is, is uh, quite uh, self-explanatory of as to what you think with regards uh, to this bill but uh, please if you care to share more we would love to know your thoughts on this um, it's a sad day for democracy here in Sin. Um okay. what we've seen is the uh, Pakistan People's Party government that has now been in power for almost 14 years and has failed to deliver any sort of relief to the masses at large in this uh, second largest province in Pakistan has today brought an amendment to the Sindh Local Government Act of 2013. Now, local government is the subject which affects every citizen at the doorstep, be it water supply, be it drainage, be it the heaps of garbage that we see in our cities and our villages. Uh, all of those municipal activities come under the domain of local government. Today, the amendment bill, the way it was presented, now, for your viewers, I want to just emphasize that the Sindh Assembly is 168 members, 99 of which belong to Pakistan People's Party. So on the strength of their brute majority, they could have passed any law as they have been doing in any case. Now, this amendment to the Local Government Act, uh, it naturally, it has certain subject matters which they wanted to keep away from the public at large, from the eyes of the public at large, and from the duly elected members of the public. The bill today was introduced and considered and voted upon and passed in such unholy haste that they bulldozed all the existing rules and regulations of the Sindh Assembly as were passed in 2013. Now, um, the uh, rules 95 going up to 115 very clearly stipulate the process in which a government bill is to be brought, is to be uh, introduced, the way it is to be given notice of, the uh, formation of a standing or a special committee to which the bill is then to be referred, where it is to be right. gone through with the fine comb, uh, yeah. bringing uh, uh, all other public stakeholders on board, their opinions, their views, Yes. And then and the eventually, system as well, right? With, they with, didn't with, with put the, it through that as well. I'm sorry. 
Better uh, uh, sir, I saw your tweet at this Farooq. Uh, you actually mentioned that they didn't introduce, the, uh, introduce these bills uh, into the st committee system either. So that is also a concern, right? One of the sad state of affairs is that there are 34 uh, rule-based committees in Sindh and there is not a single member from the opposition who has been kept as a member of those committees, which is extremely uh, ironic. Uh, the uh, the two-faced uh, political strategy of Pakistan yeah. People's Party is exposed here. That In the National Assembly, you see them crying, screaming, protesting for the sake of democracy, Absolutely. demanding uh, chairmanships of standing committees and about due process and consultation, whereas in Sindh, they're running a complete and utter dictatorship. They're, they have completely bulldozed any yes, norms. Uh, better says, uh, very quickly, can you also comment on the merits of this uh, bill that was introduced? Because we have seen your concerns about the procedure and uh, democratic uh, transparency, but I'm sure that you have seen the bill as well. Now, what was placed today was the uh, amendment uh, bill only, not the parent uh, itself. What we have seen, however, is again they have tried to create a dichotomy between the uh, local government system for the urban areas and those for the rural areas. And this is something that the people of Sindh have very aggressively protested against. This same attempt was made 10 years ago. And uh, uh, there was furor on the streets of Sindh. People were up in protest. And uh, People's Party at that time had to back down from it. Now today, having learned from their past experience, they have slipped it through the back door. I like to appeal to the people of Sindh, as well as uh, the judicial offices of the Chief Justice of the Sindh High Court and the Chief Justice of Pakistan, that this is not something that is allowed for within our constitution, within our uh, whole democratic setup. Article 140A of the constitution talks about a third tier of government, the local government system, which should be empowered, and the author executive authority has to be pushed down to the public's doorstep. Unfortunately, well, what this amendment has done... For joining us today. I'm sorry, that's all we have time for, but thank you very much for joining us and talking to us in detail regarding what is going on. Of course, you watched the debate, you saw many strange things that have been going on within Pakistan and outside the world as well. At the end of the day, what we fear the most is that, that the people are suffering at the hands of political interests and that must not be done. And for that, the responsibility that lies within the state and with the leaders of the state must be taken seriously. Thank you for joining us on the debate. See you Monday.